Sherry called me up, um, interested in finding out what I knew about gorse. And all I could tell her was that I knew that it occurred in the dunes down here near Bandon. But beyond that, I don't know a lot about it. Um, she still wanted me to come and talk to you a bit about uh, coastal dunes, coastal dune ecology, and kind of the natural history and the history of um, what has happened to the dunes over the last hundred years to hopefully set the context for potentially why we have an invasion and potentially some consequences of the other invaders that are important in dance. So um, bear with me. Hopefully this will make sense at some point throughout the day. But um, I'm not going to talk particularly about forest research, per se. Let's see here. <coughs> I, I should mention that I have two collaborators with this work. Um, Peter Ruggiero, who is at Oregon State University, he's a geomorphologist and looks at dune geomorphology. And Eric Seabloom, who is at the University of Minnesota, but was once at Oregon State University. So where do our dunes occur here in the Pacific Northwest? Um, probably a lot of you know this, but in case you don't, you know, we have pretty extensive dune habitat in the Pacific Northwest. Something like 45% of the Oregon coast um, has dune habitat or sandy beach back dunes. Um, and in Washington, almost 30%. We may have a little problem with some of my slides here, but um, hopefully it won't be too big a deal. Um, and as you know, we have one of the largest, the largest dune sheet um, in North America. Um, we're actually sitting on it right now. Um, it's something like 150 miles long and two miles deep, so it's pretty extensive dune sheet. Uh, and so we're, we're lucky in that way. Usually we think about the Pacific Northwest and we think rocky shores, but actually we have a fair amount of sandy beach and dune habitat that's pretty important um, in terms of where people live and, and, and the resources that we have. So dunes have a number of really important functions and services. Um, obviously, they provide really unique habitats for native plants, shorebirds, amphibians, rodents. Um, they also have an interface nature. They're basically um, a buffer between the ocean. So for example, ocean waves, sea level rise, um, and the land, so terrestrial flooding. So they're, they're at this interface that's really critical and, and really coupled um, both land and ocean processes. Um, they also act as groundwater recharge and barriers to saltwater intrusion, which can be really important in some parts of the world, maybe not so much here, because we don't necessarily use the groundwater that's produced or that is contained in the dunes. Um, but in particular in Europe and South, America, or South Africa, these groundwater resources are critical to the humans that live on the coast. So prior to 1900, all of our beaches um, in the Pacific Northwest and actually along the entire Pacific Coast um, were very sparsely vegetated. There was basically it was a very open, shifting sand environment, um, very little vegetation. There was one native grass. Um, Alamus mollus, which of course we still have here today. Um, but this grass um, was not really good at stabilizing the sand that um, was shifting and blowing into roads and towns and um, basically causing havoc to people who lived here. And so um, there was a push to plant dune grass on these beaches. And um, in the late 1800s, beach grass was planted in a number of places along the coast. By 1940, pretty much all of the coast from you know Mexico to Alaska was covered in beach grass. So it was a really terrific invader, um, and was helped along, along helped along along the way um, through planting regimes and. Um, two species of 
invasive grasses were planted. One was the European beach grass in the Iron area. That's where I came from Europe. And then the second grass, the American beach grass, which is native to the East Coast and also the um, Great Lakes, the Mako Grebele Gelada, was, was planted mostly up um, near the Columbia River and in Washington. What is the, how does this grass stabilize the sand? Well, essentially, you know, seedling grows, um, sand hits that seedling, it starts to accumulate a mound of sand around the seedling that stimulates the growth of these seedlings because they're um, they're very much dependent on <coughs> sand deposition for their growth. And so there's a positive feedback where the more sand piles up, the more growth there is and so forth, creating essentially these little hummocks or dunelets, which then eventually become what we call cordians. And so here's a schematic of a cordian with Mothua here growing along the cordon and, and capturing sand and keeping that sand from traveling <coughs> to the bath dam. And essentially by creating this cordon, um, what happens is there's some unique habitats that um, become established in particular wetlands behind the dam because now the groundwater is exposed. Um, and that stimulates growth of the number of plant species which eventually can lead to um, forested land and great habitat for gorse. So there's my plug for gorse. <laughs> um, and so through this through the stabilization, essentially the the ecosystem is, is transformed in pretty dramatic ways. Um, here's an example, here's a photo of Rampadin, it's just up the road a bit. Um, and here's Here's the four dam right here. Here's where the grasses occur, where they create the four dam. And you can see that behind all of that, there's essentially a forested wetland. And so these these forested wetlands were not here 100 years ago. I have a similar photo, which unfortunately wasn't able to scan last night to, to put on this presentation. But there's a similar photo, and all of this is just white. So. You know, back in 1940, um, when those aerial photos were taken, this essentially was an open shifting habitat. And now, it's a terrestrialized um, forested ecosystem. So my question is, how do these four dams, which are created by the stream grass, change these sandy ecosystems and um, the protection of people who actually live behind these? Because not only do we have this sort of habitat in um, national or in, in parks, state parks, and so forth, in BLM land, but there are also these similar kind of formations um, in towns, for example, Florence, and, and other towns that are dependent on these four dunes, four dunes that were created 100 years ago. So, a little history of the grass invasion. As I said, prior to 1900, there was a native beach grass, Elemis mollus. It is not a very good stabilizer of sand, so we never had four dunes prior to when Amakwa was introduced um, back in the early 1900s. By 1950, Amakwa Aran area was present all along the entire coast. By 19, in 1935, the second beach grass species was planted near the Columbia River, Amafla brevilegulata. Um, and as you'll see, Amafla brevilegulata is the dominant beach grass in most of Washington um, and parts of Oregon, whereas Amafla arenaria is the dominant and actually the, the only beach grass species down in this region. And that has some pretty significant consequences. How can you tell the difference between these two beach grasses? Well, if you were to look at them in the field, you would, and even if I look at them in the field, it's very, very hard to see that they're different from far away, from you know a distance of a few meters. Um, and the real test to looking at or telling the difference between the grasses is looking at the ligules, which are these little tissues between the blade and the stem of the of the grass. Um, Arenaria has a long ligule, usually it's about a centimeter long, 
whereas Breviliculata, Ammophila Breviliculata, which is our native to the East Coast, has a brevi, or very small, little ligule. And so this is a way that you can tell the difference between Arenaria, Ammophila Arenaria, and Ammophila Breviliculata. Um, Elmus mollus, our native, also essentially has almost no ligule present. Ammophila, or Elmus mollus is very, very different from Ammophila brevilligulata in appearance. So usually you can tell the native right away. Its um, color is kind of a gray, blue, or yeah, gray, blue, green color. And it's a very robust plant. And here you can see we just did some measurements in the lab looking at plant height, stem weight, and leaf width for the three different species of grasses that occur in the dunes. And essentially you can see that in terms of plant height, they're all roughly the same. But Amop or Elmus mollus has heavier stems and they have um, width, the width of the leaves are um, wider than the other two species. Amophila brevliculata, though, you can see is a little bit more robust in terms of its stem weight than Arenaria. And that, that actually has pretty important consequences. So what's the consequences of having these four dunes? Well, obviously now we have increased coastal protection for people who live behind these dune habitats. And there are quite a few people that have houses behind these areas along the coast. Um, so it's protection from waves, wind, possible tsunamis. Um, this is the Fred Meyer in um, Florence. Here you can see the four dune is protecting that parking lot. Obviously it increases the land stabilization for development. Um, it also increases the wetlands that are behind the four dune. So these deflation plain areas have increased in number quite a bit since the invasion. Um, and obviously these are really important habitats for rare amphibians and other, other species. Um, they're also terrific habitats for invasion. And so, as you know, this, these are the types of places where um, horse and scotch broom and other invaders that are a big problem hang out. Some of the unintended consequences, obviously now we have a system that is not a shifting sand system, it's sand starved in the back part of the, the habitat. <clears throat> and so this dynamic nature of the shifting sand and the plants and animals that are dependent on that kind of dynamic nature um, is now pretty much gone along the entire coast, except in places where there are restoration, restor restorations occurring. There's a decline of the number of native plants and animals, six federally listed endangered plants, and the federally listed snowy clover. Um, and there's an increase in invasions of other species. So, you know, scotch green gorse and many other weed species that are now living in these habitats, which I'm sure they could not have lived in prior to the grass and the fordian and, and the, the change in the ecosystem that occurred. So in this system we have, um, it's a pretty dynamic system. You've got climate processes, you've got the grass invasion, and you have management all kind of tightly coupled with one another. Um, and this leads to variability not only in coastal vulnerability, so um, the protection that, that these things might provide for humans, but also variability in terms of conservation and management. So what I want to do is just briefly talk about the research that we've been doing, looking at the implications of these dune grass invasions, both in terms of the invasion and coastal protection, but also the implications for the community and for management. Um, there are two basic factors that are driving this system. One is the beach grass, and the second is sand supply. And sand supply is a huge factor in determining the shape of the four dune and the kind of ecosystem that you would have behind that four dune. Um, In terms of the beach grass distribution, we did surveys from 
um, up here in Washington, down into down near Cape Blanco, so near here, um, of a number of sites, and we did we ran transects and looked at the distribution of the three species of grasses. And you can see that Amophila arenaria, which is this white um, circle, is not very abundant in Washington and becomes very abundant at Cape Lookout and then is the dominant all the way down into Oregon. Whereas Amophila brevilliculata, the one with the little, little ligules, um, is dominant all in, into Washington and then switches its dominance and becomes essentially it's not present, at least that we could find in Oregon, in Southern Oregon, central to Southern Oregon. Um, there are a couple places where there are some restoration sites where grasses were planted in Florence where we have actually found Amophila brevilliculata present. So it may be out there in some spotty distribution, but for the most part, it's not very dominant. And then here's the native, the Elemis mollus. And you can see that it's pretty much present at all the sites for the most part, but not very abundant. It's about 25% cover. In terms of sand supply, believe it or not, sand supply varies quite a bit along the coast. Um, and sa obviously sand is just deposited or lost from beaches due to waves that are bringing them on shore. And you can actually measure what we call shoreline change rate, which is the meters per year. How much does the shoreline either retreat or extend out into the ocean um, over time? And this, that's what's measured here. This is the shoreline change rate, meters per year, along the entire coast at all these sites that I showed you earlier, from Washington down into uh, Cape Blanco area. And you can see that in Washington, especially around Long Beach, there's massive changes in shoreline. Um, there's what we call progression, really massive um, increases in land, um, beach habitat essentially in these areas, something like on the order of eight meters per year. Um, and then there are places where there's a lot of loss of sand as well. Probably the sand is just being transferred back and forth from the systems. Yep. This is just for one year of measurement? It's actually over a 40-year time period. Okay. Yeah, but it's on a per-year basis. Yeah. Good question. Um, and then you can see that, that there's actually a fair amount of progression um, along Long Beach. And then as you get to, here's Cape Lookout, and you get into Oregon, you can see that some of the sites have a bit of increase or decrease in shoreline change rate. So there's some erosion happening for the most part, they're mostly erosive, so we're losing a little bit of sand every year on these beaches. What, so, I'll talk about kind of the consequences of that in a minute. The other thing that we noticed is that when we went out to measure um, these two different grasses and <coughs> in, in these transects, we found that um, the fourth dune height, so the height of the fourth dune, its width and its slope vary depending on which grass species occurred on the fourth dune. So if Amophila brevilliculata was present and dominant, the fourth dune height was about a little over three meters, whereas it doubled to a little over six meters if Amophila brevilliculata, or Amophila arenaria, excuse me, was present. So. You can see that the width also varies pretty dramatically, as does the slope. So these Amophila brevilliculata fordines are shorter by quite a bit, three meters, than the Arenaria fordines, which are taller. But as you might suspect, it's not so simple as that. This pattern is actually confounded with sand supply, because remember I told you that there's a lot of sand coming ashore in the brevilliculata areas, whereas much less in the Aran area areas. And so that's borne out in these data. You can see that shoreline change rate isn't very great with Aran area, and it's much greater with Brevilliculata. So um, this suggests that sand supply could also be a factor in determining how tall the dunes are, irrespective of the grass that's grown on it. So we wanted to figure out what was the case, and what we found is that, in fact, if you plot shoreline change rate versus dune height, there's a pretty strong relationship. 
we have very little shoreline change rate, either positive or negative or near zero. The dunes, no matter what grass is growing on it, tend to be taller. They are taller. So when you have little bits of sand coming into those um, beaches, or leaving those beaches, the dunes are much taller. Um, when you have prograding beaches or beaches that have lots of sand being deposited on them, the, the four dunes tend to be much shorter, which makes sense. It's sort of like a conveyor belt where sand is coming in, it's getting deposited, and then more sand is getting in, it's getting deposited. And the four dunes are kind of working their way out, and they never really build a tall four dune. But if you look at the data in a little bit more detail, um, and you try to separate out the effects of the grass from the sand, what you find is that the grass does have an effect, and that, in fact, Revoliculata generally builds shorter four dunes than arid area for a given shoreline change rate that is essentially similar. So Aaron area is a better four dune builder in terms of height, um, height of the dune compared to Revoliculata. And that fact is due to um, differences in the morphology of the two species, which I kind of talked about earlier. Aaron area is, has thinner stems and it has more vertical growth, so it's better able to capture sand than Revoliculata, which has more vertical growth and is less able to capture sand. And we've done a number of different experiments in wind tunnels to look at the sand, sand capture ability of these two different species and, and also the native um, and find that on a per stem basis, Aaron area is a better stabilizer and capture of sand than Revoliculata or the native. So what does all this mean? Well, we can take, we can look at the consequences of having two different grass species planted at a site um, and ask the question, what are the consequences of dune height to coastal vulnerability? The people who live behind these dunes, do you want to live behind a dune that, or a dune that's built by a grass that may not be quite as high as another grass species? And so you can do modeling to look at this. And we've done this with Peter Gero and other geomorphologists to look at what type of wave height would you need to overtop a particular dune height? And does the fact that Aaron area, or does the fact that Amapo Brevoliculata builds shorter dunes, does that matter in terms of coastal protection? And also does it matter in terms of climate change, which as you probably know, predicts higher wave heights and higher sea level and other, other consequences. So I won't, I won't go into any details about this model, but basically what we found is that when we ran these models under different climate scenarios, the Amophila brevoliculata tripled the number of sites experiencing flooding. So the idea <coughs> is that if Amophila brevoliculata is planted on a four dune, the number of times that um, fl the flooding will increase by threefold in those areas. Um, and that um, <coughs> Surprisingly, when we looked at sea level rise, we put sea level rise into our calculations. It had almost no effect on the overtopping of these dunes compared to the effect of the invasion state, so whether or not Revoliculata was present or Aaron area was present. So this sort of exercise basically tells us that if you were to plant Revoliculata or if Revoliculata were to invade the southern coasts of Oregon, the dune heights would be reduced, and that could increase the chances that these dunes would be flooded and overtopped, and people in campgrounds like where we are today might experience something more dramatic than they would now. Okay, what are some of the implications for community structure and management of these grasses? Um, if you measure the number, the species of Grasses that co-occur either with Amophila arenaria or Amophila brevoliculata, you can see that many more co-occur with arenaria than they do with brevoliculata. So again, brevoliculata seems to have kind of a negative effect 
on the community by decreasing plant diversity in this case. Um, you can see though that the number of invasions, actually the proportion of invasions doesn't change between the two types of grasses. Um, there's still a number of invasive species that are present on either kind of organ. Um, and obviously the grasses cause a decline of snowy plovers, which um, are currently federally listed. And so that has prompted um, the state parks and other parks to do restoration on these sites. And I'm sure you guys are all aware of this, this kind of restoration. Um, most of it involves bulldozing down the foredoon to create habitat for the clover, um, get rid of the grass. And we've done surveys in these restoration sites to look at um, what happens in terms of the, intensi the intensity of this bulldozing, both for the plovers and their population growth, but also for plants that live um, with plovers in these habitats. And what we found is that lower intensity of grass removal, so maybe not bulldozing every year, but bulldozing at a more moderate scale, doesn't affect the birds. The birds breed just as well with or without um, intensive bulldozing, but it can have positive effects on the native plants, which makes sense. If you don't bulldoze quite as much as you might want to, native plants will come back and be a part of the system. And so this helps us try to make decisions about how much kind of whole ecosystem restoration we want to do in the dunes and how much we want to just target particular species. Um, the other thing that grass removal does, obviously, is lower the dune height. So it's going to create a trade-off between coastal protection, so people that are living behind the dune or recreating behind the dune, versus the conservation part. So there is a trade-off there. Um, how significant it is isn't clear. And this is some of the research that we're interested in pursuing. What are some of the management implications? Well. We might consider restoration techniques that restore both the original function of the dunes, so overwashing of these dunes. If we don't care about coastal protection, we may want to try to provide restoration techniques where overwashing of the dunes could occur, salt water could come in, maybe even deal with some of the invasive species problems that we're having in these back dune areas. Um, and still create habitat for plovers and for plants that live there, native plants. They're used to having salt water and living, living in this kind of dynamic environment. This, of course, would have to occur in places where humans aren't really abundant and present. So in summary, invasive um, beach grasses affect the structure function and ultimately the vulnerability that are provided by dunes. Um, they create poor dunes that have major implications in terms of ecosystem. <laughs> they decrease native species, increase non-native species. Um, dune height is important in terms of overtopping by waves. If Breva ligulata, this species that's really abundant up in Washington, if it were to, for some reason, invade the southern coast, coastal flooding would increase. Um, and there's likely to be a, some kind of trade-off between ecosystem restoration, whole ecosystem restoration, and coastal vulnerability, and how, how humans can interact on that landscape. And that's it. Um, there are a number of people who helped with the research, um, in particular Phoebe Zarnetsky, who was a grad student of mine, um, who's now at, in Yale, at Yale University doing a fancy postdoc. Um, and we had funding both from EPA and also from Oregon Sea Grant, and um, that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Yeah. How well do the two, uh, how do the two species of the um, non-native beach grasses compete with each other? What are really the odds of the uh, I can't say Good, great question. Yeah. So we've done, yeah, we've done um, experiments in bags, huge bags that are filled with sand, and we put 
actually all three species in there, and done competition experiments or species interaction experiments and varied sand supply. So um, a big part of this is, you know, some one species might be better at competing under higher sand supply regimes or higher disturbance <laughs> conditions, for example. But essentially what we find is that um, Haemophila brevilligulata is the competitive dominant. And it doesn't really matter what the sand supply rate is. For the most part, it competes. And actually, the more sand that you put on the plants, the better, the stronger the interactions between the plants. And actually, the stronger the ability for Brevilligulata to outcompete Arenaria. Yeah. So it's, I mean, there, there, it's a plausible argument that if you plan to revel like a lot, of, it could spread and outcompete their area. Yeah. yeah. Have you thought about going back east where Brevet Lake Gulotta occurs and importing natural enemies to try to reduce its abundance and dominance? No, we haven't we haven't you know, there's no active removal of these grasses besides the restoration sites, there's no push to remove the grasses. So we haven't we haven't explored that. I'm not sure if you know that would be something that people would be interested in. I think the issue is that the grasses, you know, are friends to many people who live on the coast, and they don't actually many people don't even realize that they're invasive, that they're not native. So I think you know that's a, a question that is you know I think it's a based kind of question, do you want to have these four dunes or not? Yeah. So, with the uh, Amapa River, I can't say it. Brevi uh, <laughs> Lake Uolata. Uh, yeah. It has a characteristics closer to the, to the native grass, uh -huh. correct? It does, yeah. And so, if you were looking at some type of restoration with grasses, you, the native grass is not as, as abundant appropriate to go ahead and, and do restoration with that and, and transplant it that? It is actually, because it, it really, it does not even, so it's kind of on the extreme end of, Revoligulata is kind of in the middle in terms of its stem weight and things like that. Elmus mollus, which is the native, is really a robust grass. But the, the key to it is that it doesn't grow very densely in most areas, especially right on the front of the dune in these you know high impact sandy lots of wind areas it just does not grow very well um, you put it in the back dune and it probably would grow better and have higher densities of stems and so forth and I have seen monocultures of the native where it's pretty dense and it's there's a lot of biomass there so a follow-up to that is if you were looking at uh, restorations or you were looking at dynamic dune environments uh, you may want to put the European the, in, in, in more of the urban setting areas where we already have developed four where, dunes. We, where we want the higher four dune and the, and the higher protection type mm -hmm. environment, but go ahead and move toward either the native, the west coast native or the east coast grass in the uh, more open, non-developed areas to try to create a more dynamic dunal area. And yeah, I mean, I think... I think planting the native grass, the effects of that, for example, if you went in and you bulldozed the dune down and you planted native grass, I'm not sure what would happen. So I, I'm not sure I could answer that question, but it'd be a really interesting experiment to do. Um, you know, I don't know if the grass would just not grow very well, not really accumulate sand, because you don't want it to accumulate sand if you're trying to have some clover habitat or other things like that. So, do we get into concerns then too with loss of those, uh, those deflation plain wetland areas because of yeah. so we're, targeted we're, species in there that 100 years ago they wouldn't have been using those as their native environment? Exactly. Now they are. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important question to ask. You know, what's going to happen if you? What's going to happen to these native wetland areas if we were to bulldoze down? really large areas of accordion. Um, and 
we're, one of the things that we're kind of interested in doing is looking at that at a landscape scale because that's kind of a landscape question. Um, so I have a grad student here who's interested in potentially using GIS to look at, you know, what have been the changes over time when you do these restoration sites um, for Plover. What happens to the back dune? Well, you know, that carries on over to the to the gorse issue and the Scotts Broom issue. We pull those out. That's right. And rip those out. Then you're also going to affect that dynamic movement of sand into those inflation points. Yep. 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 So I, I'm interested in the rate of spread. Of the, uh, uh, it's not spreading very fast. Four, five years ago. I'm doing the math right. Um, I went on a field trip with Al Kiedemann and, and uh, Eric Seaton was on that trip too. We went down the coast in Washington and saw bread deliculata and then and worked our way through the grass sites. And just that very fuzzy recollection of that trip matches pretty closely to the distribution shown on your maps today. Right. But I know Eric did more work on that in the 90s right. and compared that to what you guys have done now. So, you know, is this something we need to be alarmed about, or does its distribution currently appear to be relatively stable? Yeah, so I think it's Brevaligulata spread north really well. So it's spread up Long Beach and that whole area. And I think it, it's in part because of the currents, the way the currents are traveling um, in the winter, carrying rhizomes and seeds and so forth. But then the other thing is there aren't a lot of headlands, you know, between those areas, whereas going south, there are tons of headlands. And there are what they call littoral cells, which are these areas where all the sand um, is contained oceanographically within a particular headland, between two headlands. So there are a lot more littoral cells as you go down the Oregon coast. Um, so the ability for Brevaligulata to disperse, I think, is really low. Like, it's it's a pretty hard barrier to overcome. Otherwise, I think it would definitely have been, would be down here in southern Oregon by now if it was easy for it to spread. Um, the issue would be more like, what if we transferred it here? What if we accidentally planted it, not knowing that it wasn't Arenaria, but that it was this other species? I think that's the bigger concern is, you know, unintentional planting and restoring areas with grasses that you don't know exactly what species it is. So one follow-up question. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, Revelingulata would actually cause four dunes to lower, or if it were to invade and establish four dunes, would it just exist on that part? Um, great question. I actually think that it could lower. It. And the reason is that we've looked at over the, we've looked at a 40-year data set of Brevaligulata growing up the Washington coast, and we knew what the height was 40 years ago. And we know what it is now, and the height has decreased. So we don't know if that's because of sand supply or because of the grass, but it could be both. Yeah. So looking at your charts, if I was reading those correctly. European beach grass has a tendency to have higher dunes and less washouts. And the uh, East Coast beach grass, lower dunes but more washouts. So you get a lot more of that salty water into the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But the European beach grass has more native plant growth with it. So if you're trying to protect native plants, native beach plants, you actually want the European. Although the European grass grows t has taller dunes, that might mean that the back dune is receiving even less sand. So that might cause problems in the back dune. That <coughs> it's, it's kind of unclear the trade-offs there. The other thing I should say is that even though the American species <coughs> build shorter dunes, they're wider. So there's evidence, for example, with overtopping, even if you have an overtop dune, if you have a wider dune, you know, much longer area in which water has to travel, that can also be a pretty 
strong protective mechanism. So whereas with tall dams, you can imagine them toppling over or being eroded. You know, if they were eroded at the toe of the dune, then they could just collapse and then you'd have so there's there are trade offs in terms of which kind of dune you might want to have. Right? I mean personally I would rather have a tall dune if there's a tsunami coming. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just my own opinion. Yeah. So to follow up on that, um, I, I interpreted that chart to show the relative number of native species with the two What did you account for latitude? No. So there could be there More could definitely be yeah. yeah. Potentially. Although I should say that there are places where there's overlap of the two grasses, you know, and there it's all it's only at the classifying area of Oregon. And there still is diversity differences, so, um, and it, it makes sense because Grebeligulata is more robust that it would have a more negative effect on the natives than the European one. Yeah. So you're likely to have more spaces between yep. the clumps? Yep. Yeah. And the clumps, tend, like Arenaria, tends to grow in clumps, whereas Grebeligulata tends to grow like a grass, more spread out with rhizomes and, you know, that sort of growth form, whereas the clumpy growth form, you could imagine, would be better for natives. Potentially. Yeah. Great questions, you guys. Really thinking about the mechanisms. <laughs> it's great. All right. Anything else? Thank you, Scott.